Well, I want to welcome everybody back. Uh, I'll talk kind of slowly so people can get their seats, but I'm going to welcome, every back, uh, welcome everyone back from their short stretch break. I hope you got the stretch that you needed. Um, I'm just going to, I'm not going to introduce this panel. I'm just going to go ahead and introduce the moderator. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for our second panel on quality control and kind of non-traditional higher ed. Uh, and then I'm going to let him take it from here. Uh, Eric Kelderman is a staff reporter at the Chronicle of Higher Education, where he covers state policy, uh, the future of public higher education accreditation, and occasionally legal issues and music. Um, Kelderman joined the Chronicle in 2008 from stateline.org. He's also covered education and state politics for the Gazette newspapers in Montgomery County, Maryland. 2010, uh, Eric was a part of a team of Chronicle reporters that won first prize from the Education Writers Association for their articles. Uh, Eric holds a master's degree in journalism from the University of Maryland at College Park, uh, a master's degree in music theory and composition from the University of Minnesota at Twin Cities. Uh, you're going to play us a tune or something, I hope? Uh, you know, I left my trombone at home. Really <laughs> Never mind. That'll be the next forum. Uh, and a bachelor's degree in music from Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. Uh, I should also say there's a, book, a new book out, Higher Education Accreditation, uh, and his name appears a lot, as does Doug Letterman's. And so clearly he is an expert on this topic and many others in higher education. Eric, I hand it over to you. Thank you. I, uh, I hesitate to call myself an, an expert. Uh, it's a very uh, complex process, and it strikes me that, uh, as I mentioned to a couple people, that many of the questions from the audience in the first panel were about uh, really directed at sort of a, a, a general misunderstanding about what the process is, what it does. Uh, and this may actually be one of uh, accreditation's uh, biggest problems, is the fact that nobody really knows uh, very much about it. Uh, my introduction today is going to, or my, uh, this panel is going to talk about uh, challenges to, to regional accreditation, national accreditation, from uh, what some call the, uh, the technological disruptions, what others might call the technological innovation. And uh, I just want to say that the genie is out of the bottle. While distance education has been around for a very long time, think correspondence courses, the widespread availability of the internet and increasing sophistication of its application has, as they say, changed everything. Colleges, largely for the for-profit kind, now can enroll tens of thousands of students online and pay for staff to uh, pay to staff call centers with recruiters instead of constructing a single academic building, library, or dormitory. Traditional colleges can hire a company like Randy Best's Academic Partnerships to build an online presence, recruit students, design course content, and even hire teaching assistants to do the grading, all to award a degree stamped with the name of the original college. An education entrepreneur like Ben Nelson can create a partnership between the Minerva School and the Keck Graduate Institute, which is uh, part of a, a consortium of colleges in California, uh, to offer undergraduate degrees free of charge to a small select group of students who will study online and live in cosmopolitan centers around the globe. A single course distributed for free on the internet can attract hundreds of thousands of students, giving them access to an instructor at an Ivy League college, though the number of students who have the discipline to complete that course will likely be a very tiny, tiny fraction of the original enrollees. And now, thanks to the growing acceptance of what we call competency-based learning, which uh, Sally is going to talk to us quite a bit about, a student could, in theory, go through an entire degree program with little or no direct interaction with an actual breathing full-time tenure-track faculty member. That's actually becoming rare at, at traditional colleges as well because of the uh, adjunctification of, of higher education, as we call it. All of this change, whether you call it disruption or innovation, presents challenges to the nation's accreditation system which even its supporters acknowledge is having a hard time keeping up with the pace of technological advances and emerging business practices. In addition, the process is laden, as we have heard in the, uh, the first uh, panel, is laden with requirements meant to safeguard the enormous investment of federal student financial aid in the form of Pell Grants and federally backed loans. A gatekeeping function many charge is at odds with accreditation's primary goal of improving academic quality. All of this prevents what may be existential questions for the nation's regional and national creditors who are under intense scrutiny from state and federal lawmakers who ask if the current system is adequate to both safeguard consumers and allow sufficient innovation to occur in higher education. Uh, this panel is meant to explore what the real shortcomings of our accreditation system in regard to tech disruptions, what changes should accreditors, should accreditors and lawmakers consider to fix those problems, 
And uh, if new models of, of accreditation emerge, uh, who will pay for them? I think that's a central question that we, we haven't really gotten to in the first panel, and I hope to explore that here. Um, we're going to start out today with uh, uh, Jeff Martineau, who's a consultant with Higher Education Partners uh, in Alexandria. And then we're going to follow up with uh, Sally Johnstone of Western Governors University, a very interesting uh, institution that I've written about several times. And then uh, finally, we're going to get to uh, Mr. Vance Freed uh, from Oklahoma State. Well, thank you. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm going blind, so if I periodically have to put my glasses on and off, you'll understand why. Um, I probably come at some of this maybe from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, it was about 15 years ago that I first started teaching at the college level. I was going to graduate school to get my PhD in politics at Claremont. I got an opportunity to start teaching at a large state, large state university, and I did that in different places for a few years. And then eventually I got hired to work for, of all things, an accreditation agency. And of course, before that time, probably like many folks, I could have told you what the word accreditation meant, but other than that, I couldn't tell you how it was conducted, so forth and so on. Well, in the next decade, I probably learned a lot more than I would have ever thought, and I eventually became president of the organization. Uh, the American Academy for Liberal Education, the only accreditor that deals with liberal education. Um, so my perspective might be somewhat different from a teaching and from an alternative accreditor perspective. Um, I'm also stru struck by a couple of things that happened in the first panel, and I, hopefully I won't repeat too much of what was said, but I think there will ultimately be some overlap. One of the things that's always struck me in talking about accreditation and visiting schools both in the U.S. and abroad is that when you get to talking about accreditation, sometimes you forget what exactly it is that you're doing. And sometimes I think we forget what it is colleges and universities are for, and that's for education. Research is also part of that, but these are institutions of higher learning. That's why they exist. That's why they were created. And I think sometimes when we talk about this stuff, we forget a little bit about that. And I always bring that back to my own personal experience. I remember my first day, first class, I've got 50, 18-year-olds and so, and so forth, staying in front of me the middle of August. And my first thought was, it's way too early. Go, go home for a month. We'll come back you know, when fall starts. <laughs> but I remember that first day. And I had done lectures. I had done some high school teaching and so forth. But I remember what it felt like when I first started teaching adults or working with adults. And I recognized the very beginning that it's not a science. It's very much an art. There's no exact right way. There are no formulas. This one teacher will be successful with certain students in certain ways and may not be quite successful with other students. All right? So it's different for every person. And what I mean, the reason I bring that up is because I want us to think about education and faculty and students, all right? But also to recognize that each institution is unique. It is not, in fact, like another institution just like every classroom, every faculty member, and every student. We all have our own interests. We all have the things that we want to gain. We all have our shortcomings. All right? We all make decisions differently and for different reasons. One of the challenges with an accreditation from an alternative accreditor standpoint is that we tend to want to try to fit everything into one model. Okay? We want to make most things, to make it easy to assess it, we want to make most of it look the same so we can identify a box as a box, even if, in fact, if you look very closely, you find it's not really a box. It's just stuffed into something that now looks like a box. All right? Um, so let's keep that in the back of our mind. Um, I also want to keep in mind some of the last couple of questions that were asked in the last panel. Because I think it's important to recognize what accreditation, as Judith and others have said, what accreditation does but what it often does not do. And that centered around the question of quality. And what they meant by quality, I think, was what's going on in the classroom? What's going on between the faculty and the students? What's going on between the faculty members? What's going on between the students? Okay. And when we think of particularly regional accreditation, I don't mean to pick on regional accreditors, but most institutions are accredited by a regional accreditor. Most students go to a regionally accredited institution. 
Regionally accredited institutions, regional accreditors have potentially a thousand members or more within their group. If you think about a geographic region, you think about all the different types of higher education institutions there are, but yet you have one entity that's accrediting all of them regardless of what their mission is. All right, does that make some sense? That in of itself is a problem. So when we think of quality, when they, in that sense, it's not really so much about what's going on in the classroom. In a certain sense, it can't be because of the, at least because of the diversity. When you get to a program or you get to specialized accreditors like AALE, which I led, it's a little bit different. Or ABET, engineering. We do have the ability to say, okay, let's see what's on the syllabi. Let's sit in on the classes. Let's talk to the faculty, let's talk to the board of trustees, let's talk to the students, let's actually see the sausage being made, all right? That's a little bit different than some of what we were talking about before. What we're talking about before, and I think it's the reason why we have this panel and why there's so much commotion going on about accreditation. And so the first question I have to myself is, why is accreditation in the crosshairs? It's a topic for today. Accreditation in the crosshairs. And one could argue that the reason why accreditation is in the crosshairs and why people that don't care about accreditation, don't know anything about it, now ask about it. And the reason why is very simple. Accreditation, for the most part, the perception among the public and among politicians is that accreditation does not give us the information that we think we need to make decisions about what schools to go to, what programs to get into, and where to spend my money. Now, we can get back to the question of whether that's the role for the accreditor or not, but the reality is, is that people want to know more information about the institutions before they decide to put their money out. Well, accreditors are kind of the obvious choice to look at, and most of the time accreditation doesn't do that. And one could argue that that really answers the question, and the debate has to stop there. Because if we look at, we can look at legislation, we can look at um, all the arguments about for and against accreditors, but if at the end of the day, much of the accreditation doesn't actually deal with the substance of an education, what exactly is it that we're talking about then? Well, what happens most of the time is process, all right? As Judith and others have pointed out, what we tend to look at is, do you have the hallmarks of what we think a good, successful institution has? Buildings, faculty with degrees, so forth and so on, all right? Because more or less we've learned over the last 150 years what things have to be there for an institution to survive and to do well, all right? But remember, those outcomes, those statistics we collect are process. They're not substance. That's a problem, I think, up front. One of the, the other question that I want to look at is, how can accreditors deal with this diversity of institutions? At AELE, we dealt with really two types of things. Either colleges that practiced liberal education, or programs or parts of universities that taught the liberal arts and cared about liberal education. When we went into those institutions, we were able to then, we had criteria, academic criteria, courses, how things had to be taught, all right? We would sit in on classes and talk to faculty about how are you actually teaching this? If you say that writing and they have portfolios, if that's part of the assessment, guess what? We're going to start pulling those portfolios out. We're going to start looking at those student samples, and we're going to interact with you about, okay, how is it that the faculty have made these decisions that you're going to do things a certain way? So how in this, with new technology, where you can learn a language online, where you can sit in your, you know, there's a great commercial I hear on the radio a lot about how you can be in your pajamas and take your class anytime you want, all right? Well, that's a little bit different. I mean, correspondence courses have been around a couple of hundred years, but things have changed enough for us to have to think about them and look at them a little bit differently. So how can accreditors deal with some of this? Well, I think the, the, the crux of the problem ends up being that there's a disconnect over means 
and ends. All right, means and ends. And I mean that in three areas. A college has ends it's trying to achieve, and it has means to get there. The U.S. Department of Education has ends it wants to achieve, and it has means for getting there. Students have ends they want to achieve, and they have means for getting there. Part of the problem is, is that the means and the ends at the college level are not in line with what the U.S. Department of Education wants to pursue. At least that's my experience. So that, so that what we're now going to have is a report card. And I'm only going to talk about it for a second. This is the political solution to this problem that I've just outlined, which is what's actually going on on the campus. We want to know more about that. So the political solution to that is going to be a report card. Now, we don't know everything that's going to be on the report card. My guess is, since we've, we've heard certain things, it's going to have a lot to do with how much does it cost to go there, what are graduation rates, and a lot of statistics. Well, as you all know, statistics can answer some questions, and it can answer some questions fully. But it may not be able, in this case, to answer the most important questions. So for example, if an institution charges more, is that necessarily a bad thing? If Fewer stu if students leave over the course of four years to go someplace else, is that a bad thing? Is that the fault of the institution? There are a lot of things to be thinking about. And we can step back. You know, my, my daughter's 19 and a sophomore in college this year. She makes decisions that I, that I go, how, why in the world did you make that decision? And how did you get to that decision? But what I recognize is that we're all like that. Well, to what extent do the choices that the students make, how does that bear on the institution? How accountable does the institution need to be for the choices the students make? Well, one could argue that institutions ought to be more careful in admitting students and talking to them about the possibilities and prospects for what might happen down the road. That's certainly a possibility. But does that fall into the realm of accreditation? I'm not sure that it does. The second point is that we expect too much from accreditation. Accreditation is supposed to be an improvement model. In other words, and, and, and I'll, I'll digress into peer review, and I'm going to cast peer review differently than was suggested before. Peer review as an academic means that you have other people in your field review your work and make comment on it in some way, shape, or form. That's not quite the same thing that happens in accreditation peer review. In peer review for an institution, you may have people from like, some similarities in, from schools that will come and visit your school. You, the school's written a self-study, and they will reflect on that self-study as they talk to you and they look at the institution. That's not quite the same thing as, as reviewing an article for a journal. They're actually quite different things. So I would actually argue that one could, in fact, see that it's not necessarily incest and it's not necessarily self-perpetuation. It depends on how it's handled, but that's an open question, I think. So we've moved from an, from an improvement model to a police model or a compliance model. So you know, 10 years ago, when I started at AELE, when we go to the department, they'd have a, basically a checklist on how they would evaluate us. And we always understood that you know, you may, we may not, the department may not be able to check every box. Let's just say there were 100 boxes they thought the accreditor had to be doing things a certain way. And they may come back and say, look, you're not going to have all 100 of these boxes checked. That doesn't mean you're out of compliance. That's changed. It's changed both for the accreditor and it's changed for the institutions. That literally, if you don't have a check box, you don't have a check mark in a box, you are not out of compliance. And you go, really? We've got hundreds of points that we have to look at. We have a handful that you aren't checking off, and we're out of compliance. Does that make sense? Is that the best way of doing this? The system that we have is not set up for this kind of quality control. It's not designed to tell you what's going on between faculty and students. That's not the purpose of the system. If we want that, we're going to have to change it. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit.
The system that we have now, which is largely driven by the US Department of Education, which means it's statistically driven, with people in the department that frankly are not competent enough to be making the decisions about higher education. What they've done is essentially they've created lowest common denominator for every data point, whether it's financial compliance or it's anything related to substantive. It's a lowest common denominator. And one ought to wonder whether or not that's proper for review in higher education. Because to me, it looks an awful lot like what we do in K through 12 now. A lowest common denominator both on content and how we evaluate. Is that appropriate to have that approach for higher education? Or in fact, haven't we always understood that higher education is supposed to be about more than that? If we think about, you know, we, 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 my question for Judith earlier was, what about all this money out here and what about the oversight? Well, let's think about it for a second. Where did that money start from? Well, we have the GI Bill right after World War II, and then we have the Higher Education Act in the mid-60s, and that's where all the money starts. But when you go back and you look at the discussion, you look at the historical record and the congressional record, you find that they understood that job preparedness was one aspect, but it was not the sole aspect of students going to college. And we understood that the taxpayer money was not merely for job preparedness. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? We live in a democracy. We have something resembling a market economy. We can't have a basic education at the college level but yet we run the risk of reducing, continually reduce education to merely job preparedness, the lowest common denominator. We're overly obsessed with outcomes now, but the outcomes aren't on substance. The outcomes are on process. And you need to remember that whenever, you, whenever they're looking at test scores, these are not necessarily about outcomes of what the education the student got at that institution. All right. It might say something about the process, but it doesn't say anything about what the student did or did not necessarily learn. Let me end by trying to harp a little bit more on quality and how we might get to it. I want to I kind of focus on solutions a little bit. Um, and this is where I'm going to have to put my glasses on because my writing is very small. <laughs> um, some of my possible conclusions. Reduce the scope of accreditation or accreditors. In other words, right now, if you're an accreditor and you accredit Georgetown, Georgetown already has to communicate directly with the U.S. Department of Education literally every day on finance because they receive student financial aid. That doesn't go through the accreditor. They already deal with the Department of Education directly on finances. And if there are financial problems, by the way, because they audit them every year, they let the creditor know, by the way, there's a problem. And they have, the, they have scores and indices, and schools have to be a certain place in order to get Title IV funding. Well, that's already out there. The department's already doing that. Why not take that away from accreditors? Well, what, what might that do then? If you take away the gatekeeping function for Title IV and just have the department deal with it directly, that opens an oppor oppor opportunity, doesn't it? That opens up the opportunity for the accreditor to focus on other things, like quality, all right? And so in one sense, you could, the, 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 what you could then say, you can extrapolate, is instead of having regional accreditors, all accreditors then become national accreditors. And both the department and Congress could change the law that says, okay, fine, as long as that accreditor is recognized by the department, you're eligible for Title IV. But now we're gonna open it up and you can go to any creditor you want that you think fits your mission of your school. So if you're a liberal arts college, you go to the liberal arts accreditor and so forth and so on, all right? Now, there's problems with the department still having to approve of the accredit accreditors, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that another time, but that's a, a possibility for making a, a significant change. Allow lawsuits. Allow students to sue the colleges over quality, over what they think they did or did not receive. Allow them to sue public schools 
Think about how the effect that might have. Now, there might be some problems with it, but also think about what might that do, what changes might that force, all right? How that might make colleges think a little bit differently about accountability. Take a look at general education requirements. One of the challenges that we have, and it's one of the reasons why I think the regionals have so much of a struggle with accreditation on substance is, there was a time, you went back 20 years and further back, you could make certain assumptions about what was going on on a campus. Whether it was a private school or a public school, we all more or less knew that the first two years were basically foundation years, and the last two years were major years. Well, that's more or less been done away with. Something called what I call a Chinese menu system now. So there's really, there, a lot of places, they may say you have to take certain numbers and units and credits, but there, it's not necessarily thought out. There are some liberal arts colleges that, that do think it out very well, but in many state schools, there is no thought to it. You simply have to take something out of each of these pods. Well, if we go back and, and question that, that offers some other some challenges. Now, keep in mind that this is also a weakness for accreditation, because the federal government, by law, is prohibited about commenting and looking at content and substance and curriculum. All right. So the feds can't do this. So it's up to the accreditors to decide whether or not they're going to put these standards into their own documents. Many of them have eliminated them. Some of them are putting them back in. AELE was created because many accreditors had moved away from general education and core requirements. There were many schools that thought that is not a good thing, and we ought to have an accreditor that has standards that say you have to do that, and then also promotes liberal education. My last thought is, is this. We need to think about schools as institutions of higher learning again. But we also need to recognize they are businesses. The difference between a not-for-profit and a profit is what? It's a tax designation. All right? It might mean there are certain incentives for a pro for profit school. But let's think about the not-for-profit for a moment. We can think of public schools. I know very many college presidents that they, they think of the school as a budget. I have a dollar figure that I need to achieve each year. Okay. Well, just because, is, is that an appropriate way to be thinking about an institution of higher learning? I have a budget. How am I going to achieve that budget? How am I going to bring enough dollars in? Well, if you start thinking about content, and about doing things in a certain way, that would be good. But if you don't, and you merely think about, we have to, we have to find a way to get more students in. And there's all sorts of small schools that they really struggle with this. They, they really, it's been very difficult for them to get enough students on a year-to-year -year basis to keep operating. Well, what happens? We start recruiting more students from overseas. We start lowering standards for students and so forth. All right. My last point is that there is one benefit that I would say exists in the current system. Right? And if we left it alone, I think this one benefit is worth it. Under the current system, every college gets the chance to build its own reputation. Every school can become known for something. And over time, they do. I'll, take a I'll pick on a local school, St. John's College in Annapolis, which was a member of AULE and is a very unique place. You know, you know, St. John's is a great book school. It's an oddball place, isn't it? But it has a reputation. And everyone that applies there, they know what the reputation is. There's no secrets about it. A place that I went to, Claremont McKenna College, it has a reputation, has a good reputation in the politics department. Well, that's well known. They, do, you know, they, they made sure that they built a reputation in a certain way. The current system allows that. When we go to the report card system, will that still be in place? Or will colleges' reputations now be bound to what the Department of Education thinks are appropriate statistics for a school. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think the last panel did a, a wonderful job of opening up some of the broader policy issues. And as you can tell, what we're trying to do with this panel 
um, as we were directed to do so by Neil, and thank you for including me, uh, is, is to bring this down to a level of, uh, as, as Jeff put it, understanding what accreditation really is. I'm going to take it down to some of the issues that arise when you uh, have an accreditation system that was designed for one environment bumping up against a new way of thinking about what is the uh, means of delivering high quality uh, instruction and programs to students. And I think Vance is going to take us down even another level and talk more about uh, programs themselves. As was mentioned, I'm with Western Governors University. It's an institution that's about 17 years old. It's completely online. It's a nonprofit uh, pub or private institution, although we have affiliations in a number of states, so we're, I don't know, somewhere on the line, but we don't get any state funding. So we run completely on tuition. Uh, we are, as I said, online, and we're the only competency-based education institution really to scale. We have over 45,000 students in the last 17 years. We've had about 30,000 graduates. And the total cost for our students, which finances the operation of the entire institution, is under $6,000 a year. And that includes their learning resources, books, whatever. Now, uh, we operate differently. We were developed to operate differently. And some of the critical features about not just WGU, but competency-based education, as it begins to tangle with accrediting practices, I think are worth mentioning. To start with, the notion of competency-based education flips the relationship in our more traditional settings between time and mastery. Students are learning at their own pace. They don't sit through classes that start at the beginning of a term and march through with cohorts till the end of the term, and then everybody takes an assessment at the end or writes papers or whatever, and some folks get it and get all of it and earn a grade, a very high grade, and others may only get about half of it, and they fail. In our world, we expect everyone to pass. For some people, that takes a much shorter period of time than a full term, and for others, it may take longer. But the issue is, it's framed to be individually, or to be oriented toward the individual student and his or her learning capabilities. Um, in that kind of environment, our students are really very closely supported, and that's true of other uh, programs with which I've been working, but the notion is that our students have one-on-one -on -one discussions with our faculty, usually on a weekly basis. We also have found that in the model that we have produced at Western Governors University, our students persist at a much higher rate than more traditional colleges and universities in their online programs. Remember, ours is entirely online. And in fact, our persistence rates are as good as or a little better than most comprehensive universities. Now, another place where this gets a little squirrely for accreditors is WGU does not create its own learning resources. Our faculty do not write lectures, nor do they deliver them. We buy and license learning resources from commercial and non-commercial producers of these resources. And that gives us a terrific advantage because we can change those as needed. And we heard a comment with regard to, um, in the last session, you know, how we have faculty at most of our traditional institutions that were granted tenure in the 60s and they're still teaching what they taught and they're perpetuating that model because as new faculty come into the mix, it still happens. And I've served in roles at very traditional institutions and would suggest that's very much the case. At WGU, we don't do that. We're in a position where we can take advantage not only of changes in the content in any field of study as they evolve, but in addition to that, the changes and the evolution in the whole field of learning sciences. So how can we best create a learning environment so that our students are learning what our faculty think they need to be learning. 
So in our model, there's no seat time requirement. We don't track seat time. We do, however, map what we do or map our courses to credit hours. And, and we do that really, or did it initially, because of accreditation and financial aid. However, it's obvious that there's another reason to do that. The majority of higher education right now is in the world of courses with credit hour equivalencies. And our students, like all students, will transfer courses in and transfer courses out. So by mapping them to the common currency, we allow, we allow our students to have portability with that. Another issue for the usual visitation or peer review teams that look at Western Governors University, and we are regionally accredited and also accredited by a number of uh, national associations with professional programs like nursing and education, teacher education. Uh, but, it, but an issue that comes along for us is that our learning resources and our assessments may not be created by the same faculty teams that are working directly with our students to help them master the materials. Whoa, we've just turned everything around. And when you have somebody come in as a faculty member or a peer reviewer from a more traditional setting, it really is very confusing to them. And it takes them a reasonable period of time to just figure out what in the world is going on. Once they get it, they really appreciate it. But that's usually what our accreditation visits, a great deal of our accreditation visits are sent doing, are spent doing, is helping people understand how it's different. So students are progressing to their degrees in a CBE model or competency-based education model by demonstrating mastery of the materials that have been determined are required for uh, developing that competency. But this isn't done through lectures or classroom activities. And that means that the assessments have to be very good measures of learning. In other words, they have to be valid. But in addition to that, they also have to be both secure and reliable because the reputation, as was pointed out, of our institution or any competency-based program within an institution is going to be based on how well the students are actually able to do what we've said they can do. Now, for the last year and a half, I've been working with 11 community colleges across the country as they create their own competency-based education programs. And all of them are focusing on, because their community colleges workforce needs in their area, but it's all in the area of IT, um, wide variety of areas within that. And I believe there's a handout, if there was a place for handouts, which I missed, uh, that we left of a, a very recent change uh, magazine article on delineating what some of those issues are and how they work together. But through that work with those colleges, I've had the opportunity to work rather closely with a number of regional accreditors as they begin to puzzle through what in the world do we do with competency-based education programs. And even though all of our colleges have very similar frameworks of what they're doing, that is, even though the students can work at a variable pace, they are progressing through demonstrations of their mastery of the material, they are not um, getting away from courses. So they're mapping everything they do within their traditional course environment. And yet, the three regional accreditors with which we're working because of the distribution of these uh, institutions have had very different responses to the inquiries and discussions with those institutions. Some of them, I'm very proud of them. I've done briefings for their boards. We've helped try and help make that happen. And they've, they've made this fairly un, um, it's not a tough thing to do. You basically can do a checklist. Are you fall in this category or that category? And if it's in the appropriate category, you can move on. So there is no barrier to moving in that direction with some of the regionals. With others, they're making it much more onerous. And, and that's disappointing. Um, I do want to turn to the issue of accreditation. I happen to be a fan of accreditation, even as a federal gatekeeper or a gatekeeper for federal funds for all kinds of reasons. Um, and we've heard sort of pieces of this in different ways. But 
as Judith mentioned, uh, even though they've been in, in the federal gatekeeping role for 60 or so years, most of these associations have been around for over a century. And they are where they are today because they developed in a very different era. And I thought Judith did a very good job of trying to help us understand that they were designed to be peer review quality improvement, even though we don't want to use the word quality, uh, improvement environments to help good institutions get better. We are now looking at a compliance model. Um, I don't know how we abandon them, though, and still be able to have any sense that we have a form of quality assurance and, at the same time, an affordable way of reviewing what these institutions are doing. I do think that the regional accreditors, as a, in their gatekeeping role, needs to need to expand the framework that they're working under, which is happening. But they also need to expand their commissions where appropriate, and certainly those peer review teams. It's not just about <coughs> academics anymore. It's also about state regulatory frameworks, and it's about what employers are expecting. And if we expect our institutions to be producing students who are able to move into the workforce, we better have some representatives from the workforce involved in those reviews. So in essence, I think regional accredit accreditation, while doing so to some extent, needs to move even faster to move from an institution-centered analysis to a student-centered analysis. Um, there does need to be a means of auditing student learning outcomes. It can be established by the institution and claimed by the institution, but there needs to be real evidence that the institution is, is doing what it says it is doing. Some of the key uh, indicators that we've heard that might be uh, issues around federal compliance, that is the cost of the degree, the average salary of a graduate, is, are the graduates moving into employment in the field in which they studied? Um, you know, are the students satisfied with what they're getting? Uh, what kind of default rates does an institution have? What kind of graduation rates does an institution have? How are, how are students being retained? Those are all important pieces of information that could be included in an accrediting review. It doesn't have to just immediately jump to a federal review. But we do need more transparency. And as we all know, most students do not make decisions about where they're going to matriculate based on a chart or or a ranking or anything else. They're making it based on word of mouth by friends and family or their local community or a variety of other issues. We do need to be sure that those team reports and commission responses and the institutional responses to those are out there, that they're, they're available. They should be available for people to see. Another piece of this, which again, it's beginning to happen, but probably needs to accelerate, is we really need harmonization across the regions. If the regionals are going to be uh, the gatekeeper for this very important framework of who gets federal financial aid or who can administer it and who can't, there needs to be some real harmonization across the regions. And it is um, disappointing to me that in working across five different states and 11 different colleges, for basically the same kind of activity, we're getting very, really variable responses from the regionals. Uh, I would, however, suggest, uh, and you're going to get to hear a, a counter to this, that we still need to have a level of institutional accreditation because we have to have some level of accountability. And in all of my years and experience in higher education working in a variety of capacities, I don't know how to take that down below an institutional level. I'm going to stop there and look forward to questions and turn this over to my colleague. Thank you. OK. Uh, <clears throat> 
start, you can tell I'm the long-term faculty member here because I'm the only one with PowerPoints. <laughs> uh, here's the normal obligatory disclaimer that the people who pay my salary really may not want to claim anything that I'm about to say, which is really one of the cool parts about this job. Uh, the one thing that I really am going to come from a different perspective in a couple of ways. One, uh, I am a professor of entrepreneurship, okay? So some of what I'm gonna say is more of an analysis, just general entrepreneurship regulatory policy as applied to innovation, and it just happens to be higher ed, okay? So that's part of the perspective. The other part of it is it really is higher ed, and I've been 27 years as a shop floor worker in the industry. Okay, so I think I know a pretty good bit about what actually happens on the, the shop floor. Uh, okay, current innovations. A lot's going on, and you just heard probably about the biggest single innovation that has really uh, gotten traction and is incredibly level of scale already. Right now, we're in a position, these are technically straightforward, but they're hard to actually get in, implemented at a specific institution. And when I say technically straightforward, I don't mean that they're necessarily easy to do, but that we do know how to do them, okay? We already know how to do competency-based education because Western governors already figured that one out, okay? And we're in a thing now that we really have a real good position. We know what to do. And you've got two basic ways that you go about getting there. Uh, one, you don't force students to buy the whole bundle of activities that one would normally associate with college, research, coming of age, network access, instruction, instruction credentialing, job placement. Uh, you know, you may come at them and say, oh, well, we're only making you buy this piece. Uh, coming of age, for example, Western Governors doesn't worry about a coming of age uh, function. Uh, and then the other is just to perform activities better. And that's one of the points I want to make is a lot of these innovations, it's not just that it's a lot cheaper, which you didn't, Take note, she said $6,000 per year without any state support and without significant donor support. And no endowment or? Some day. No, I mean, no, Western Governors. No, 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 no. Okay. Someday we'll get an endowment. Okay. <laughs> so basically, they're doing this charging $6,000, and they're using that to pay all their bills, and they're at $6,000, okay? But it's not just as cheaper. In a lot of areas, these things are making it, the innovations are making the quality better. Okay, where they're hard to implement is there's several barriers to innovation, and if you're coming at it from an existing institution standpoint, the first one is motivation. Uh, life's pretty grand as it is, at least speaking from a state research university professor standpoint. Uh, I started 27 years ago. I thought it's a pretty nice thing when I started, and it's just gotten better. Uh, so why do we want to do anything different? Because the current model's working for us. So you have that, and then... If you do want to you know, start thinking about changing, one of the ways that you are getting to this lower cost uh, position is you have fewer administrators, fewer faculty. So how you get there in an existing institution is you have to downsize, and downsizing isn't fun, and not that many people are really motivated to come in. There's no great joy in, in doing that. You also have a lot of organizational issues, like your structure, your people, you got your tenured faculty to deal with, your whole processes that you go through. 
And this is an area when we're talking about major innovations just in a normal for-profit business is a real problem if you're really good doing things the old way, you can't really be the leader in doing things the new way because you have this whole organizational uh, sort of drag uh, that's put on you. And then on top of that, in education, uh, we have this very involved decision-making process that basically everybody's in charge, but nobody's in charge. So it makes it real hard to do anything really significantly innovative at most schools. And then the pro final one, which is what we're talking about today, is regulation. Now, some basics of regulatory policy for innovation, uh, and this isn't just higher ed, this is anything. Centrally planned innovation doesn't work. Uh, we're in the Hayek Auditorium, and Hayek would say there's a huge knowledge problem. If we knew exactly what we wanted to do, it wouldn't be an innovation, okay? So you've got that issue, then you get a lot of politics come into play uh, as well. You really don't want to try to force innovation on the unwilling, okay? Two reasons. One, you can get a whole lot of political pushback. And two, they might be right. I mean, that's why we're talking innovation. Uh, if we knew it's going to work absolutely for sure, it wouldn't be an innovation. And then the other, I mean, your basic strategy is you just let the willing innovate like Western governors and then allow the others to follow. So your main policy thing you want to get done is to remove barriers to innovation. In higher ed, accreditation is a big barrier. We've been talking about a great deal today. Uh, federal aid, Department of Education, by recognizing particular accreditors is controlling access to federal dollars. But if you actually look at accreditation is a state level issue. The states have the right to say who can do business in a college in their state. And then they have a great deal of power in the ability to allow transfer of credits into their state systems, which are two huge uh, sources of power. But both the states and the Department of Education have deferred to the regionals. So I'll give you an example. Oklahoma, our state accrediting board has written a policy and it point blank says everybody's accredited who's accredited by North Central, who's our accreditor, Higher Learning Commission, or any of the other recognized accreditors. And oh, by the way, yeah, we'll accredit you, but we're going to apply the exact same standards as North Central. And then we Xerox off the basic North Central. And that, that's what it is. Uh, for real, you can go take a look at it. So currently, you're getting both a total, almost a total deferral uh, of power to the regional accreditors. Regional accreditors, you know, started out as trade associations of colleges and universities by geographic region. But because the government has given them monopoly power, they're actually cartels now. Now, some of you may like cartels, some of you don't, but since this is a Hayek Cato thing, cartels, that's a bad word, okay, in this building. Uh, okay, by having the cartel accreditors, the good side of a trade association is limited. This thing about member improvement that we've been talking about. Uh, another good part of a trade association uh, is the reputational marketing. I think some from ABET was here, and uh, where I am, we're part of AACSB, and that's one of the sales pitches is, hey, we use this because you're better than other people, because you're a member and you can use this in your marketing. Well, the problem with these cartel accreditors is everybody's a member, and we're not peers. 
uh, I don't know, we're maybe 2,000 in North Central members. And I'd say from a research university standpoint, there are probably 150 research universities max, okay? Those are our peers, and probably a few of them may not want to claim me or, you know, vice versa. But we clearly have this, the membership doesn't have much commonality. So you can't get this good side going on. But you do have the dark side of a cartel that gets fully empowered the way the current setup is. And that's students have to buy from the members of the cartel. Uh, educators like me, we have to work for members of the cartel. Uh, we don't have the benefit just to go say, hey, here, there's a student. I'll cut you a better deal and we'll just cut out the middleman. Uh, because we're pushed into having to deal with the middleman. Um, innovative members are stifled by the status quo. And what uh, Sally said to me is really striking, that you have members wanting to innovate. And some of these regionals are very much stifling their ability to innovate even when it's something that we already know works. Um, and then finally, your ability to have new entrants come in is severely restricted by the way the, pro the process works. So solution I'll put out uh, is basically allow regionals more freedom, but provide numerous alternative accrediting options and they could have different missions, standards, ownership and structures, the whole thing can be different. So long as they are protecting student and taxpayer against diploma mill scams. And yeah, I mean, you're accrediting association, you don't want to say we're scam uh, control, and you may have loftier views, but that's the basic thing from a, a taxpayer standpoint, is we want to protect against that happening, okay? So you can have a wide degree of differences between accreditors and still hit that threshold level, just make sure they all hit that threshold level uh, of performance. So some ideas just for samples. Uh, recognize all members of CHIA. This would be for Title IV funding, just overnight do that. Uh, I just picked 10 at random. 10 existing colleges that have currently gone through all the hoops, been certified, cleanly accredited. They can just leave the regionals and start their own association. Okay, because we already know they're good. We've decided they're good. So they'll just have a smaller set of peers and they might be their true peers. If we're going to do anything with MOOCs, well, let's just let Sarah, yeah, it's a for-profit, currently private uh, for-profit, but I don't think people are really saying, hey, they're members, uh, whether it be University of Virginia or wherever, are low-quality uh, schools. Um, individuals with experience at accredited institutions, form an accrediting business and accredited individual courses. Uh, I mean, I just think who's the best person to accredit to say how good a uh, entrepreneurship course is, if it's a real high quality course, me, okay? I've done this for 27 years, I've got a pretty good idea. And if you don't just totally trust me, I'll find a few other people and we can go in together, but there's nothing magic about letting the existing people define what's getting accredited. Uh, and actually, I'll prob I will have higher standards than the regionals as far as expectations of what they're gonna look like. Okay, so in case anyone wants to do this, how you could achieve that, for federal dollars, uh, Department of Education starts recognizing some of these alternatives. 
You can have legislation, federal legislation, creating alternatives. Or then you might have federal legislation that lets states create alternative systems, and that's current Senate Bill 1609, or the, the Lee Bill. And what that's basically saying is for purposes of federal dollars, anybody that is accredited by a state can participate in Title IV funding. That's, that's the logic of that. Okay. Now, from a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for the right to do business transfer credit, states exercise their crediting powers and they can just create alternative systems on their own. They don't have to have federal approval. Okay, they can't get uh, Title IV funds without federal approval, but access to Title IV funds isn't an issue to many students. Or actually, I think a majority of students don't participate in Title IV. So you got a huge part of the market that doesn't care. And then you're having some low-cost educators come on and they say, hey, we're designing a system that, you know, there's more hassle dealing with the bureaucracy to get the federal money than it's worth, and we're just cheap enough as is. So that leads us to the hopeful outcome of a great education available to all without the need for Title IV. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to ask uh, one, cre one question of, uh, of each of our panelists, and then uh, uh, I'll ask them to keep their answers very short, uh, if possible, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, quickly. Um, uh, for Jeff, I want to ask, uh, uh, you talk about uh, changing what it is that, that accreditors uh, measure in terms of, of the outputs. Um, I, I guess I have a question for you. Can or should accreditation be a reliable source of information uh, that students and parents can use uh, to choose a college? And, and if so, what is it that accreditors should be telling these folks? In other words, what, what three or four basic outputs uh, that, would, that would be understandable by most of these folks looking for a college uh, should accreditors be reporting? Well, I think that part, part of the problem with, with how the question is phrased is that we're assuming that the, the accreditor needs to make that decision or is the arbiter. Um, another way of thinking about it might be, what about the individual school? Um, what is it that they think is their strength and what, the, what do they want to put out there? Um, and then, then as part of the peer review process, and that is the body that makes the decision for the accreditor, that's where you have that interchange of saying whether or not this is, legit, these are legit, this is a legitimate point, there's good evidence for it, yes, you can say this publicly, or you're going to have to pick something else. Mm -hmm. So I think there is room there as part of the peer review process. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Sally, uh, you talk about the, the difficulty in, uh, in implementing the, the competency-based education uh, at these community colleges and the, the initial difficulty that Western governors went through. Uh, how much of that is, is a problem with the accreditation process and how much is a problem with uh, the federal government's inability to move away from the credit hour standard, which we all know has been, I mean, it's, the possibility has been out there for a long time, but, but until, for instance, Southern New Hampshire really pursued it, uh, they hadn't given it much thought. Nobody had thought about how do we do this. And, and even with the uh, uh, requirement or, or allowance for direct assessment, it still has to be linked back to credit hours because it is part of the federal law. Right. You know, so what, what we're doing is workarounds, but as I suggested, there's some benefit to the workarounds to the students because we still live in a world in which the majority of higher education is based on courses that are linked to credit hours. And if a student comes, you know, goes through a number of our courses and says, you know, this isn't for me, I want to transfer this to another college or university, because they are courses that we use a formula to get it to a credit hour equivalency, they can do that. And that's a benefit in terms of just normal student behavior. But the, the issues are not really accrediting. They are, to a very great extent, the reliance on the credit hour as a unit of learning. And we know that the Carnegie Institute 
is examining that now, but I don't think they're going to come up with a quick solution. I, I wouldn't hold your breath. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Vance, uh, you talk about this, uh, you know, creating alternatives uh, to the current accreditation system and or letting the states uh, create their own uh, accrediting bodies. Um, how do you create a bunch of alternatives without, without I guess, creating I, I, one thought that comes to mind is, would that, would that create sort of a race to the bottom? Uh, there are already some national accreditors who, are, uh, who have not terrific reputations for allowing some of the, you know, some of the uh, problematic institutions in. Uh, and the, actually, the second question I want to ask you is, uh, you know about the, the state authorization rec reciprocity agreements that are underway. Uh, those are being formed in order to avoid a, a huge uh, and costly patchwork of state regulation uh, so that uh, Western governors and, and other institutions can move across state lines offering their courses online, or, or in some cases, brick and mortar institutions. Um, if you create a bunch of state accreditors, aren't you sort of uh, replicating that, that problem uh, all over again? Okay, well, your Two questions, actually, so I yeah, lied. I, I'm asking your, your Vance, too. first question, uh, race to the bottom, uh, you know, do the people in particular states care less about the quality of education that their students are getting? Uh, so... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I don't really see that as an issue. Hopefully you create a race to affordability where people really focused on how can we get affordable quality out uh, to students. As to your question, in, in this is not, the states already have full accrediting power, okay, as is, okay, that's the law. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that, that you would have, uh, in effect, reciprocal agreements, it, you could just work that into a decision. But aren't you then just creating one big, you know, national sort of uh, accreditation model that, that everybody buys into, uh, and you've, you've, you've essentially, you know, created sort of a monolith? But they, they don't have to buy into the model. If you have multiple accreditors, mm -hmm. uh, for example, a state says, okay, we recognize automatic. Right now what they do is they give automatic accreditation to the regional. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we give automatic accreditation to anybody that's regionally accredited, plus here's a list of 50 others that we vetted and we think's fine, and we're going to give accreditation to those. Okay, Sally, you wanted to weigh in on I, this? I do want to weigh in on that because the uh, we, we learned this reality back in the early 2000s with the sprees where we were basically giving states the authority to uh, license or, or approve institutions within their states for federal financial aid. Um, I think it's not impolite to say it was a bit of a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, having, having worked at the Western State Commission for Higher Education for many years, I have some probably too intimate a knowledge of a number of our states, in fact, quite a few of our states. And not all states have any kind of recognition system. They don't have a higher ed commission per se. Right. It doesn't exist in every state. In addition to that, as soon as we move into a state recognition model, what happens to national institutions? So WGU happens to be headquartered in Utah. Well, okay, we're licensed by Utah, but we're also licensed in 50 other states. And not all of them care, well, they do care about regional accreditation, but many of those other states have terrific requirements that they pile on. And because we've gone through that recognition in all of the states, it's, it's so variable, it's not funny, uh, and, and it doesn't work very well. So if we went to a state-based system, the evolving national uh, institutions, which are working in different kinds of ways, kind of get left out in the cold. Yeah, and you can make an argument that in, in one line that it's interstate commerce, uh, yeah, okay, I've heard that so one. then the federal government would have the power to preempt an interstate carrier. So you would actually have two systems 
if you just want to do business in that particular state, you would could credit with that state, or if you wanted to do it uh, federally, you'd do it through whatever federal agency is set up on doing that. I think if we do that, we need to move to more of a system uh, like we do securities laws now, where it's more of a disclosure-oriented system. I think that's pretty workable at the national level. Uh, but to have a real rigid, this is how it's going to work, is I don't think it's a good recipe for anything. Right. The, the other issue, I think, with the state-based uh, system is uh, I talk with a lot of state legislators, and I can just imagine the conversation about asking them uh, to come up with a whole lot more money to regulate the higher education institutions that want to operate in their state. So I, I think there's a cost issue uh, involved there as well. They wouldn't have to. How would they? How would how would they do it then? Well, if they don't want to do it, they don't have oh, to. Oh, I see. I see what yeah. you're saying. Okay. I mean, it's All right. Not making right. them do anything. No, that's true. Good point. Okay. Um, so let's open it up to uh, questions in the audience. If anybody has some, uh, please raise your hand, and I'll uh, I'll call on you. Right there in the. And then over there. Thanks. I'm Chuck Hickman. I'm a managing director at ABET, which is, was mentioned in the earlier <laughs> session, is the global accrediting agency for engineering, computing, applied science, and engineering technology. For 20 years, I was one of the senior staff people at AACSB, the global accrediting agency for management education. Excuse me, the premier global. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting to that. Okay. Yeah, let him finish. <laughs> and I served on the WGU Advisory Committee for Business Programs for a dozen years. Thank and you. <laughs> you're welcome. It was one of the most rewarding experiences I've had um, in the time, Sally, that you have to give these presentations. You can't possibly cover, you know, all of the trials and errors. Absolutely. That, that it took to get to the good point. Um, so I'm, I'm listening to this from several perspectives, and, and it was Vance's comments that are prompting two of my questions, but really any or all of you can respond to them. Number one, I recognize that this session is intended to center mostly on institutional accreditation. But thinking both of uh, management education and technical education, there are, just in the United States, many dozen completely online degree programs and hundreds that are largely online, a mixed model. In engineering education, there are more than a dozen accredited programs that are entirely online. Uh, there are not more because there is a, um, a piece of engineering education that's very applied or experiential in its nature, and that's so far been hard to convert to an online format. So, Vance, I, I agree entirely with your comments about all of the institutional disincentives, motivations at, at places like the, the, the school you're at, but knowing what I know about um, the innovation, particularly new delivery formats, it's hard for me to think of accreditation as being one of the principal barriers to that kind of innovation. Care to comment? Well, I think probably what we're seeing now as a business school, and I think this is sort of true of engineering, is you're seeing a great deal done by accredited institutions online, okay? We have online MBA, online masters in entrepreneurship yeah, your school. right now. Uh, the issue right now, what I think we're primarily doing is we're still keeping our price up and somebody could come in and provide the same thing at a lower price. And because of the accreditation process, you're not seeing a new entrance. So you and I can't go together easily and start a cool online business school, even though we know how to do it. Second question. The external critiques of both technical education and management education focus not on the technical skills that are, are I'm sorry, our technical, the technical knowledges 
that our graduates leave campus with, but instead perceive deficiencies in what I will call the affective or non-cognitive abilities and skills, leadership, entrepreneurship, communication skills, ethics, uh, appreciation for cultural differences as a part of work teams, and there's a long punch list that probably most people yeah, in this not room be exhausted might. here. If we move to a, um, a process of recognizing or accrediting courses, which tend to be centered on technical knowledge. Could, yeah. I just want to make sure that everybody is yes, there. the question is, how would we capture or reflect those external demands in a process that is, at least what I'm hearing you say, would be centered on technical knowledge? Well, the uh, technical knowledge is what is, is deliverable fairly clever, clearly and measurable. Uh, as far as the effective side of it, it's hard to measure how you do it, how I don't think we do a very good job of it. Business schools, uh, liberal arts schools do a worse job of it. We at least, I think, say we care. Uh, but liberal arts schools are just this menu of whatever we want to cover. So, you know, it's a big problem, but I don't know how much of that is, can you really do that very well in formal schooling? Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, there was a gentleman right back there. Uh, hi, my name is Steve Ehrman. I'm the vice provost at uh, George Washington University. Uh, the word course has been referred to a lot, and I understand the real world that kind of compels one to think about that, and there's a lot of pressure, among other things, from students who want to be mobile and transfer from one institution to another. I look back at my own education, it's very difficult for me to trace anything uh, that I can do today to any one isolated course that I took. And my experience is that faculty and students in a course are in a very bad position to understand whether the students learned anything of value. Uh, it seems like a better perspective if one had to pick only one, which obviously has its weaknesses to pick only one, that a better perspective is to look at what the students seems to have gained across an entire body of experiences and uh, courses, extracurricular experiences, and so on. I'm wondering what, on the one hand, accreditors and, on the other hand, institutions can do to try to increase the emphasis on understanding something of the value or lack of value of an education by looking at it over a greater span than just a course, rather than giving into the idea that education can simply be reduced to course-sized chunks, and then you can, you can assess its value by adding up the assessment of each chunk. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase. You're asking how, how do accreditors measure student learning outputs, student learning outcomes over the course of their education? If they can do a better job of that, right. right. I, let me, Go ahead. Let, uh, let, let, if, if I may, let me, let me try a shot at it. Um, you know, the push for class, you know, a, a single class assessment or assessing things in every single course um, you know, that, that's really been pushed on accreditors from above very recently. Um, and my, my, I would say two things about it. I would say partly because those people at the Department of Education that have that idea, they don't know better. Um, that's just the reality of it. That, I mean, if you think, one thing we have to keep in mind when it comes to assessment, all right, is the culture of assessment generally. Um, and oftentimes the culture of assessment is, if it can't be assessed, it's not a value, okay? Um, and so what you get is, okay, well, we can, we can boil it down to specific course, specific learning outcomes, check did the student achieve these things within that. Now, when you get to, say, a four-year curriculum or three years or five years or whatever, it becomes much more difficult. And I tell you why it's difficult for the school and then why it's difficult for the accreditor. It's difficult for the school because many of the schools don't have succinct missions, that they can then go back and evaluate over the course of, of four years, this is, this is what we are hopeful for with our students, and then at the end be able to somehow gauge it. If you, I, I'll use St. John's again. You know, at the end, you know, St. John's goes through Don's rags, 
which means that essentially the students become accountable for not just finite things in a particular course, they become responsible for bringing different pieces in from a variety of courses, and then they go through oral examinations at the end of a semester, end of a year, to verify that they actually know something and they've thought about it. So part of this comes down to the school. What is the school going to do to try to calculate for that? And then for the accreditor, the only way to do it would be that the accreditor would have to have a standard that somehow captures that to then force the school to then be able to articulate it on their own. I'll use AELE as an example. AELE does that and did do that. And so schools, in fact, have to think about things over the course of four years. For us, it was, we don't, we don't say we wouldn't care, but we were less concerned about success in a particular course. We were much more concerned about the education over the four-year degree. And uh, Sally, go ahead. Yeah, let me do a quick response to that, Steve, because I think it's a very good question. And when we, we look at the course as the only unit of analysis, we miss all of that, I believe. And you can, when you're designing a full program, whether it's in a competency-based environment or whether it isn't, you can still have an entire curriculum that builds to yes. the kinds of leadership activities and ability to communicate and demonstrating appropriate uh, sorts of perhaps non-specific technical uh, skills and knowledge that are integrated, again, across a curriculum, not just within a single course. And, and that's part of why I think uh, an appropriate level of analysis for the institute or for the uh, creditors is at an institutional level. But could the accreditors do that better? Well, perhaps. Uh, and they can do that by insisting that the institutions not necessarily have external frameworks for it, but at least define it within their own institutions. So you maintain this notion of institutional autonomy, but it is not only defined, it is also measured in some way. And it may be through portfolios, it may be through a whole lot of different kinds of assessments, but it, it can be done at that level. It, it can I, be, but few, uh, few, you know, that is part of the problem. Schools don't generally do that, unless they tend to be small schools. But once you get larger, it becomes more of, a, a, more of an issue for the faculty to all come to an agreement on various things. Okay, with that, we, we have to wrap up. I apologize to those of you who had questions and didn't get a chance to ask them. Um, but uh, I urge you to come to lunch and uh, accost the speakers on your own. Thank you.